Great, terrific. Well, I'm Joanna Pineda. I'm CEO, 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 <laughs> and Chief Troublemaker here at Matrix Group. And hey, Nan, you want to say hello? Hello, I'm Hey Nan Landa, and I'm CEO with Optimal Networks. And your haircut still looks the same. Mine looks a little different. Oh, the hair's disappearing. So. <laughs> I'm thinking of actually going bald. Oh, this I summer. see. All yeah. right, we'll take a new picture. <laughs> Well, before we get started today, just a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar, so we'll send to you within the next day or two a copy of the slides, a link to the recording. And this is a topic that's so important that we hope that you will distribute the slides and the recording far and wide because Please. we think everybody really needs to think about social engineering. Now, we're going to mute everyone, so if you've got any kind of problems, call the main line, ask for Renee, and she'll you know, try to help you out. If you've got questions, Russ is monitoring the chat in Zoom so that, um, and he'll let me and Henan know if there are questions. And then certainly if, you, if you've got questions after today's webinar, you can find us on social media. We've also got contact information for us at the end of the webinar. So, Perfect. social engineering. So before we get started, um, I think most people are familiar with Matrix Group because we've got quite a number of clients on this webinar. But for those of you who don't know us, we're a digital agency based here in Arlington, Virginia. We work with mostly associations and nonprofits, but not exclusively, but really pretty much. Um, associations and nonprofits from around the country, and they, they hire us to solve these four problems. Increase membership um, or reverse some kind of decline. We're really seeing kind of you know, big differences between some of our clients, where some are just absolutely cruising and they really want to capitalize on that, or some are saying, you know, we've got a little decline or a big decline. We've got members that are also saying, look, we've, we've got to stay relevant. We've got to figure out how to make um, our web mobile offerings and all of their offerings really, really kind of um, relevant and very crispy in today's environment. Some of our clients want to reach new audiences. Maybe it's Capitol Hill. Maybe they want to be direct to consumer. And then finally, for most of our clients, they're really saying, hey, can you help us streamline some of our operations so that we can do more with the same number of staff? So we do all of this through these services. It always starts with a strategy. Who are you trying to see? Um, who are you trying to serve? What are you trying to achieve? And then whether it's a website redesign, a mobile app, a new AMS, or integration between these systems, or maybe it's some type of a custom system, um, we really bring a user-centered design and a lot of analytics to bear on any project so that, so that it's, it's ultimately a success. So if you are looking to redesign, if you're looking for just kind of a refresh of your system or you feel like, you know what, my systems just aren't doing as well as they could. I feel like they're okay, but they're not great. We hope you'll give us a call. Hey, Nan, tell us a little bit about Optimal. I will, and I should also tell, tell us that you know, you and I have known each other for about 16 years now. We're so young. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been working together at joint clients and the like. And, yes. Um, well, a lot of your focus is external. Our focus is on the internal IT side of things. Um, so this is just some quick stats about us. Um, and we are an IT outsourcing company. We do, uh, you know, we really try to, to help companies move their technology forward, to help associations move their technology forward so that, um, well, actually, if you go to the next slide, I'll show, I can tell you why associations come to us, which is also for three main reasons is that you know, their top level executives are wasting an ungodly amount of time dealing with internal technology issues and riding herd on their technology team, whether it's internal or external. It's probably the number one reason folks come to us is they're really frustrated that, and they're not happy with their technology um, team. Um, second, as important as it, is, as it is on your end for, for uh, collaboration and you know, Chris, external presentations to membership, we're dealing with that on the inside, and organizations who are feel like they're behind on um, mobility and collaboration for employees. That that's a place where they come to us. And finally, and also relevant for today's conversation, is we spend a lot of time, and people come to us when they're worried that their data and their privacy is not secure, or they're not sure, or they're not sure. Right. 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 And if you don't have the confidence, it's a problem. And it's an executive level problem these days. Yeah, so we've got a lot of clients that work with Optimal and really turn to Optimal to manage their networks, manage their 
the cloud services, whether it's Office 365 or G Suite, and then don't you do backup and security audits and all, all that, that stuff, stuff and help desk and yeah. yeah, really good stuff. If you need help in that area, please contact Hainan. All right, so enough of the infomercial. Today, we're going to be talking about social engineering. And as always in these webinars, we have a lot to cover. Everything from what the heck is social engineering to what do these attacks look like? And ultimately, how do you protect yourselves, your families, and your staff? So uh, this webinar is going to be jam-packed with information. And it's also going to be a little bit of a back and forth conversation between myself and Henan. Henan, you and I talk lots about these attacks and how some of our clients have been victimized by them, which is why we decided to do this webinar in the first place. So yep. hopefully we've got a lot of good information to share. So I'm going to start with a story. So we actually have a joint client and we got a call from our contact and she said, we think we've been hacked. One of the admins got an email from what looked to be the, the, one of the senior VPs. And in the email, he asked for a copy of the membership database. Specifically, he wanted all the member companies and the primary contacts. So the admin ran the report, uh, exported the data, and then emailed it to the person, only to find out that it was not the senior VP that had asked for this data. The email had been spoofed, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll talk about that later, hang on. And where did the data go? They have no idea. And they said, oh my God, Joanna, we've been hacked. And after some forensics, we said, you know, unfortunately, you haven't been hacked. You've been socially engineered. We can't actually protect you against these kinds of attacks because as long as people are able to access your systems, grab the data and send them to anybody they want, I can't protect you from that unless you want to shut down your email. Right. So, so Hanan, what exactly is social engineering, and why is it so scary? Look, it's the it's the oldest thing in in the world. It's a con job, right? It's just it's just you're getting conned. I mean, it's what happened to me in in New Orleans when I was down there when I was 22 years old, and someone offered me a free ticket and said, "Hey, come and play this game. Here's a free ticket for you to play this game." And I walked into this dusty old shop where there was like this miniature little bowling alley, and they had, handed me a a softball and they said here throw this softball at these little pins and I did and they all fell down and there were numbers on the top of the pins and they added them up and they said you got 49 points that's unbelievable you are amazing how did you get that all you need is a hundred points to win this amazing VCR by the way back then a VCR was a big deal right, right, right. <laughs> and um, and I was like cool let's let's do it and they're like um, the next roll is a dollar. I'm like, ah, oh, what's a dollar? You know, what's a dollar? That's it's a thing. dollar. I get so 49. I'll probably get 100. I got 49. Exactly. So I gave him a dollar. I got no points. I gave him another dollar. I got two points. I gave him another dollar. I got one point. I gave him a, and then all of a sudden, he's, and I'm at like 65 points, getting close to 100. He's like, oh, and, and the next roll is $5. And I was like, hmm, what do you mean $5? So I gave him $5. When I hit about $87 is when I finally realized that I was never going to get 100 points. But I was socially engineered. They got $87, and I walked away with nothing. The question good story. is, did you keep the girlfriend? I, the for, girlfriend for, a while, for a while. For a while. He's a crazy guy. Yeah. But look, social engineering has always been around. You know, it's, it's people on the street, but now it's a very, very dangerous part of our computing. It's high stakes, right? High stakes. It really takes advantage of people's inclination to be helpful and mm -hmm. to be kind. Because Correct. if someone says to you, I need your help, yes. you immediately have a different kind of a reaction. Yes. You want to help because unless you're a psychopath, mm -hmm. you generally react well to those types of requests. But right. people can take advantage of that. So just some stats, you can read them for yourself. I mean, 95% of security breaches are the result of social engineering and human error. Right, so, which is what happened with your client, and it's what happened with a lot of our clients. And absolutely. It's, it's no longer the case where you're just having these hackers in foreign um, countries just trying to break into your systems through the firewall. I mean, they are but it's a very small part of what's happening. These so days. that's that's what's kind of scary about this, right? So we'll, we'll invest time and money into our networks, making them secure. We'll invest in the best firewalls. We'll invest in the most amazing kind of AV system, mm -hmm. but 95% are coming in through people. So, yep. so I think what we're trying to say today is 
pay attention to the biggest hole here, to the biggest security vulnerabilities, which is your people. So social engineering takes the form of different types of attacks. And this is right. really interesting. Hanan, you're going to go through all of this. And I found sure. this so fascinating when you, you and I talked about this. So phishing, we know about phishing. We, we do know about phishing. I'll just try to quickly explain the differences and we'll go into more depth um, later. But phishing is when you have an e when you get an email from an institution that you trust, right? Apple, Facebook, um, but these are fake, fake emails, your bank, credit card company, um, the IRS, you know, when you get an email from that or it looks like it's from them, that's phishing. Spear phishing is when they actually customize the email to you. Right, so it's not just a so broadcast email. Instead of just email. trying to randomly send out four million emails, they're targeting Ross or Correct. Ryan or Correct. Dave or Hinan. Exactly, and they might know something about you. Like right. they might have gotten your password off the dark web. Or maybe they don't even need it. They they know your email because it's on the web. Oh no, I'm right? saying they got the they got your password and they tell you that they got your password in the email. Oh. If you some people, this is a big scam going around right now where they send you an email and try to extort you for money. Um, so then there's something called whaling. Whaling is fun because those are really big fish, and those are when they go after. Spear fishing, but after like a big banana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a tuna. A tuna. <laughs> or a whale. So, you know, where they're actually sending emails as if they're from the CEO, and they're sending them to the CFO trying to get money. Okay, so that's like big, and they're trying to get big money out of these people. So that's called whaling. Then you have my favorite word in the whole universe now, which is smishing, right. which is when it's not through email, uh, where they actually send you an SMS, a text on your phone with a link in it, and they try to get you to click it. And what kind of a text message would get me to click, unless it's from you know somebody I know and it says I'm going to be late to the school? Well, they could actually spoof the phone number, so it could look like it's someone you know, and it could have a link in it, and it could say, hey, are you interested in earning $300 a month for putting a little sticker on your car? If you are, click here. And people will click it. And people will click it. And clicking in and of itself may not necessarily represent a breach, but it's when you start providing information. Correct. So, so it's done through SMS, and that's what makes it smishing. Right. So then there's vishing, good grief. Which is... Um, you know how you call your bank and you get the automated system and you press one for this and two for that and that's where they actually use that same type of system to get the they call you and they say this is your bank click one for this and two for that and they start walking you through a process to get your information so that's voice phishing baiting is giving you like setting out a trap for you right it's like putting a USB drive with the label payroll on it on your desk, what are you going to do with it? You're going to plug it into your machine. Right. Right. You've been Salary baited. Salary increases. Salary increases. Exactly. Um, Pretexting is when they present to be some, when they pretend to be someone you know, as opposed to. On the to, phone. Uh, it could uh, be anything. It could be anything. Email. These are more general. Oh, there's the, yeah. hey, I was traveling to England and I got into right. trouble and I right. need help. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which I've gotten from people I know. And then piggybacking is when, they sort of uh, try to hang out with someone who's got access. So like um, they might be, the, like traditionally this would be someone who's dressed as a delivery man and waits for the gates to open to a secure building and then like comes in with their truck. You know, that kind of thing, that's called piggybacking. So those are just some of the different types of targeted attacks. You don't really have to know all this stuff, but you do have to realize that they come in in so many different ways to get your information that you actually have to start being suspicious. So if you think about it, so if I were, you know, entering my mom's building, for example, which is a secure building, and the UPS guy says, hey, can you let me in? I'd right. probably say yes, because, yeah, like, you're carrying would. a big package, and, like, you know, some old lady, like, is waiting for whatever package. Got to be careful. Yeah, you got to be careful. And then I, th I think about how my mom called me and said, hey, I got a call, and he was pretending to be your nephew and he said he was in jail mm -hmm. and he said please don't tell my mom but i knew that he was in japan oh well, my god what was that and i said mom i'm so glad that you just hung up on him right because my mom actually keeps track of all the kids and the grandkids listen we have a, a neighbor in our, in our community um a little older and he got a call from someone pretending to be the microsoft windows department we got an alert on your computer 
can we take over your computer and fix it? And he let them into the, the, his computer and they ransacked it for all his credit cards and personal information, which I'm sure they went and sold on the dark web. Right. You know, one thing to know is that this, all the stuff that they can get, your credit card numbers, your social security number, your driver's license number, you know, your bank account numbers, even just that personal information, they can sell on the dark web for um, Bitcoin and it has pricing and it's worth it for them. Like they actually make money from this, even if they don't get you to transfer money directly. Wow. Yeah. All right. So scary stuff. I'll tell you what, it's a little sad, right? Because you do have to be suspicious and you want, you're just wanting to help. That's true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think maybe what you're telling us is that it pays to be a little bit paranoid. It does. So let me tell you a story of what happened. This is, um, this is an example of whaling, <clears throat> if you will. So um, I got on a plane and went to Israel and uh, on vacation for a couple of weeks. And shortly after I landed, uh, my COO, David, received this email. And um, you can see it up at the top. David, I can't get on my phone right now, and I need you to process a quick payment before the end of the day. Let me know if it can still be done so I can forward details. Kind regards. Now, luckily, David, because he's, guy. he's a smart guy, um, and he realized immediately that it's not me, right? Because I'd gone to Israel, and... I've known him for 18 years right. <laughs> and, and I never sign an email kind I regards. Know, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, and so David's trying to, trying to get, he's starting to play with them and he's saying, Hey, I'll call you in this. Um, and if you can follow the, the trail, he, David finally got him to say what he wanted. And he said, uh, please process payment for night. It's a very specific number. You know, so they try to make it very, very attractive. But this is the kind of email that people are doing that's a, that's a whaling email. And uh, we've actually had clients try to transfer the money. One of, the, one of our... Oh, it's happened to our clients. Yeah. One of our big clients um, actually received... Their CFO received an email from the executive director, quote unquote, um, at 4.59 p.m. just as, as she had started closing up shop. And she wrote him back, and he he requested $180,000, and she wrote him back, I'll take care of this first thing in the morning. And it bounced. And if she hadn't written him back... Um, and had just done it. Had just done it. But I will tell you, they're much smarter these days, and they won't... Um, the emails won't bounce. Right. They'll go back and forth, like you can see right. between David and this fictitious person claiming to be me, um, who, by the way, has spoofed my email address beautifully right, in the right, email. Right. Um, so it's, so in this yeah. situation, because this has happened to our clients too, we had a client that transferred money to a bank in Liechtenstein. We have another client that transferred to a bank in India. What we tell them is always be suspicious. And why would a senior exec be sending this request via email? Voice verify is what Always we voice verify. But sometimes they can fool the voice verification. So just make sure. So face verify. Like be face, in their office. And face say, verify. Oh, you voice verify. Ask me. Initiate your own communication. Yes. You know, do things that are outside the norm. Right. Yeah. This is the, probably the best. I'm so glad you put this in the in, in the slides. This is probably one of the best videos. I want you all to take a, a look here at how easy it is to get information to hack into account. Uh, I think he describes it in in this. Video. Yes, this is worth. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby 
I'm sorry. <laughs> my my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, tell you that. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for usage information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. Maybe sign it. Um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, uh, email .com? Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message. Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. Set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her set up. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they, they, just gave, they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're going to have to go on and change your password account. Yes, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. He got scary stuff. You know, I think we have all done a version of this, right? nice be nice to someone to get them to give you information yeah sure you know like hey but it's, but you, it's usually well intentioned yeah well right intentioned absolutely yeah like, because the person on the phone wanted to be helpful yeah not everything goes according to the the rules of the, the people set out and the woman on the phone sounded legit and there right. was a crying baby yeah. and the crying baby sound really makes you feel bad yeah huh yeah pretty scary stuff so let's just show you a little bit uh, how easy that is. Um, on to on to fun. What is this? On to funnier stuff. <laughs> on to funnier stuff and equally serious and scary. Yeah, equally serious and and scary, but but a little funnier. Um, I don't know. Can anyone guess what this is? So go go into the Zoom chat and tell us what this is. And for the uh, people who get it right, we'll send you something. We'll send you I don't know a pen. What do we got for them? <laughs> A pen. We'll send you USB. We'll send you something. Close. Anybody? Close. Anybody? Uh, USB connector. In a USB connector. Yep. Uh, eh. Uh, eh. I can't. I can't hold it anymore. It is. It? it is a USB plant. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Growing out of the ground. Growing out it's of the USB ground. Plant. Hang on. It's a USB plant. Look, this is what I was talking about earlier. If you have a um, if you are walking around and you see somewhere on the floor, on your desk, you see a USB drop. In the parking lot. In the parking lot, like next, exactly. Um, and many people will take this USB, especially if it has the word, like we said, payroll on it. Or, it doesn't. or if it doesn't. And you're like, what is this? And your curiosity gets the best of you and you plug it into your uh, laptop. And most laptops have some kind of autoplay turned on and you're you're immediately compromised. Right. Or it says, hey, do you want to give access to this USB stick? Right. Do you want to suck stuff off it? Yeah. Or do you, you want to say double yes. Yeah. Or do you want to double click on this spreadsheet that says payroll numbers on it and then it'll launch a, a motion. Oof. So just be suspicious. Take something like that and give it to your IT department. Give it to your IT team. Probably or, information. Or throw it away. Is legit data you shouldn't be seeing it. Yeah, or throw it away. Crush it. Yeah. So it doesn't Crush become it. bait for somebody else. All right. So Beware the USB plan, it's dangerous. <laughs> so hey Nan, we've talked about the different types of kind of attacks, right? Where where are we vulnerable? So anywhere we take in information, anywhere we're communicating, um, there is vulnerability. So we have to look at this. We have to we have to be a bit more suspicious, a bit more worried about our email, phone call, text messages. Wi-Fi, believe it or not, you walk into a Starbucks and or any sort of place where there's free Wi-Fi, we need to be suspicious. Because um, why is that? Explain it to folks. Well, for two reasons. First of all, if it's free Wi-Fi, uh, many times uh, you're, what you're doing is 
kind of, what you're doing on the internet is kind of open season. Right. Um, there's no protection on it. So we want to get protection on it. We'll go into how we do that. Um, but also, you need to be a little suspicious of free Wi-Fi. I, I, uh, I saw a wonderful video where a hacker was sitting in a Starbucks behind the person working, and they sort of set up what looked like the free Starbucks Wi-Fi because it said free Starbucks Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. You click on it, but it was actually this uh, woman hacker who was sitting behind the person and basically taking over everything that he was typing. Because anything that's unencrypted going through the air, yep. they can now take. Yes. Now, the other thing is, I, I tell people to be wary of the cyber cafes overseas where you can use someone else's computer because they could be logging everything you're doing. Absolutely. Right? So, like, I walk into a cyber cafe in China, and I log into my email, I log into my online banking because I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks and I've got to pay my bills. Well, guess what? They just logged all the keystrokes to get into my account. Yes. Well, in China and Russia and places like that, they you need to take special precautions to do computing. Really anywhere. This yeah. could happen anywhere. This yeah. could happen in St. Louis. Yeah, sure. Um, online purchases. If you don't know the retailer, if you if it's not Amazon or something you're used to shopping at, uh, and you're trying to buy something because it looks like it's too good to be true, it probably is. Got to be wary. Or it's maybe a retailer that isn't paying much attention to security. Oh, also possible. Yeah. yeah. They could have their site compromised. Right. Uh, social media. This is another place where people. Uh, there's a huge uptick in social media scams. Uh, there were, in 2016, there were something like 250,000 social media scams, financially based social media scams, that in 2018 went up to like 450,000. Wow. It's, it's just a hotbed of <coughs> people trying to, to get your money there um, and your identification. And then like anything physical, USB drives, access to secure areas, things like that. All right, so now that we are plenty scared. I'm terrified. I'm, know, I'm, I'm sitting scared. here hiding under the table. You can't so, see me. <laughs> and for those of you on the phone, I invited Matrix staff into this webinar. So there's a whole bunch of them, and I, I hope that they're suitably scared. And I hope that they're going to go tell their moms and dads, too, because I think for us who are in IT, we're kind of we're kind of trained to be a little bit paranoid, right? Like I remember I got an email from what looked like a client saying, hey, can you see I sign this DocuSign? Mm -hmm. Long time client, there's no way I'm signing any type of contract with this with this client because the contract's long been signed. So I called him and I said, hey, did you send me a DocuSign? And he said, nope, delete that email. So I did voice verify and I was kind of, you know, accordingly suspicious. But, um, you know, some people just aren't. You know, I would also like to say that you're more paranoid than no, than most, yes. and that the IT industry is not exempt from this by any any stretch of the imagination. Um, and there's a well, in our favorite tools section, there's a company called Know Before, right. and they profile the industry, all industries. Right. And right. The IT is just you know there's a bit of a know-it-all thing going going on with the IT folks. Um, and so when they run their phishing simulation campaigns to try to teach you what is phishing and what isn't right, phishing, right, right. Um, believe me, we get caught. I got caught. I got caught and um, I got an email which looks like face from Facebook said your account has been compromised. I got it on my phone, so I didn't really pay attention that it was it looked perfectly legitimate. Right, right. And I and I clicked like an idiot. And I clicked and it was luckily it was one of the phishing simulation emails. Right. And it came up and said, Hey, you're a first time clicker. Now you have to watch this video. <laughs> but you really all of us have to be aware of yeah, it. Absolutely. You know. So anyway, let's let's get through some. Okay, so what's number one? Number one, learn exactly what I was saying. Learn how to sniff out phishing emails. There are weird web links in these emails. Take a look at them. Don't go to them. If you see a link you don't recognize or you just don't any link, unless you're expecting it, don't go. Um Type it into Google. That was a great idea you had that we were talking about earlier. Take so my idea is if you if you look at an email and you say, what is this domain? I don't go directly to the domain. I actually type it into Google because Google these days, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. If a website looks like it's got malware on it, we'll actually in the search results say, this site has malicious stuff. Like we recommend that you don't go there. So I type it into Google. Right. It's a good idea. And then sometimes the link you see there is not the link they're getting you to yes, and I click an on. Example it. of that, right? Uh, well, here's an example of a PayPal email that looks just like yeah, PayPal. It looks just like PayPal. They want you to click on that login to your account and go to the resolution center. So instead, open up 
your browser and go to PayPal and log into your account. Don't click on that link. Just don't click on it. <coughs> Just get away from the habit. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. And this one. This one. So take this is a great, great example. So you can see that link that says myuniversity.edu slash renewal, right in blue. And that's what it should be. But if you actually click the link, look below, that's where you that's where it takes you which is a malicious site. And you can do that. It's very easy to make it look different. Because anyone can register a domain these days. Yeah. Right. And for those of you who know any kind of HTML, myuniversity.edu slash renewal is what I wanted to display, but the link itself is actually different. So what you want to do is hover over the link yes. and say, is this, is this really the link? Now, the problem with this email and this URL is they look so similar that you could be fooled. So you oh. really want to be very careful. You do. Um, in fact, the uh, that's the key is they they'll make one little change in the URL or they'll they'll change a letter in an email address and it fools you. It's meant to fool you and it's it's subtle. So right. You have to, yeah, it's have really to be clever. Cool. All right, number two. Be suspicious. More paranoia. More paranoia. <laughs> Right, but if someone wants your credit card number or your social security number or your mother's maiden name, um, just be careful. Go. So here's one that has been um, affecting some of our clients. So they run trade shows, right? And they, they, they sometimes will publish the names of attendees. They will sometimes, often, all of them will publish the names of their exhibitors. So one scam that we know about is that the exhibitor will get a will get a phone call saying, "Hey, Hanan, we see that you're registered for the ACE Technology Conference, but we see that you don't have a hotel. Can I go ahead and help you with that?" Hmm. And you say, "Oh, wow, I don't have a hotel," and, and they'll be like, "No, you don't have a hotel. I can take care of that for you. Just give me a credit card." Oof. Wow. There's your credit card. You know, and it sounds legit, right? Because yeah, it sounds legit. Who the heck knows that we're exhibiting? Right. The world, actually. Yeah. Be suspicious. I think we've beaten this one to death, but be careful. <laughs> Do you remember the I love you virus? No, I've, for, I've tried to block uh, all these out of my mind. The I love you virus and the Melissa virus. I remember. I remember the names. I don't remember what they did. So this one was like, it looked like it was like some kind of a love note from somebody. Oh, and it right. wasn't necessarily your sweetie. And what I told people was like, for right. God's sakes, if someone other than your SO is sending you an email with I love you, use that note. <laughs> And even if it is from your loved one, like enough with that. All right. Get verbal or written authorization for financial transactions, which makes a lot Correct. of sense. It's good for the audit trail anyway. Absolutely. Because it's written. Right? And call them on numbers that you know. So if they email you and they say, hey, call me on this cell phone for verbal verification, don't do that. Call them on the number that you know they That's right. answer. That's right. Yeah. Number five, aha, we've talked about this. We have. So tell everybody, because everyone thinks, oh, look at that, a USB stick. Well, for God's sakes, like, what are they, 10 bucks these days, five bucks? Not even. Not even, a dollar <laughs> in some cases. Like, just stomp on it. Yeah, stomp on it. it in the Put it in your garbage disposal. There That'll you be fun. Don't do that. <laughs> Put it in the shredder. Can okay, do I don't think you so. can. All right. Maybe the industrial shredder. <laughs> All right. but, but, you know, like, protect the next person. Okay, number six, aha. This oh, is good. probably my favorite. This is good. So we were trying to think through how, Joanna, how many websites do you access? I don't know, but according to my password manager, it's in the hundreds. In the hundreds. In the hundreds. Yeah, according to my password manager, I'm also at 455 yeah, different it's websites. crazy, and you're obviously not yeah. accessing those every day, but in the, in the span of a year, you might. Right, and, and so the issue with password security is you want there to be a strong password. And a strong password means one that's difficult to crack. Right. So you want it to be long. You might want it to have some special characters in it. Um, and generally, these things get to be difficult to remember. And so you will just na human nature, you'll start using the same password on every single website that you right. Or maybe you'll have three that you rotate. Right, right, right. Right. So if one of those passwords gets compromised, all the sites that you're on, or a third of them, will be compromised. And I think, Hanan, what people don't realize is that passwords is now kind of the domain of international crime syndicates. So if, if an email gets compromised, then it goes up into the cloud, the crime syndicates get to it, and they say, oh, well, 
if J Panetta matrix group and the password is password one two three works here, let's try it on Schwab. Yep. Let's try it on Amazon. Let's yep. try it on iTunes. Let's yep. try it on whatever. And if you're using the same password, you're done. Oh, you're done. They'll get in. They'll get in. And so, and you certainly don't want to be writing them on little sticky notes and putting them on your computer. Well, that's probably safer than like <laughs> sticking it in password.xlsx on your computer. Well, probably true. Right. Um, so, very strong recommendation these days is use a password manager. Right, and if you don't know what one is, what is a password manager, Hainan? Uh, it's, a, it's a program that actually stores your passwords. Well, sometimes, most of the time, it'll actually make up really strong passwords for you and help you change your passwords, and it'll fill in the blanks for you. So when you go to a, a website uh, like Amazon or whatever, it'll put in your username and your password, and it'll help you log in. You and don't have to remember it. You don't. It means You'll it's really always, hard. Yes, it can be a very difficult password. And so, I mean, it's a database of your passwords. So then you have to remember one password, and that's the one to get into your password manager. And, and that one would be really hard. Don't ever forget it. And don't write it down. And don't write it down. Right. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, you know, some people say, well, Joanna, because I use LastPass, for example, and you write, you like Dashlane. I do, and as although company, I'm switching to LastPass. You're switching to LastPass? Okay. So, um, and as a company, we use Secret Server, which we'll talk about in a second. But, um, you know, somebody said to me, well, what if Secret Server gets compromised? And I think... Secret Server, even if they get compromised, because all of the passwords are actually hashed and salted, right, which means it's a one-way hash, they might get access to the data, but it's going to be really, really hard to crack it. And actually, on LastPass, if you forget your master password, I don't believe there is a way I don't think there is. to get it back. So no. that better be the password that you remember. Correct. Or else you'll have to go to every one of your 400 websites and click on, I forgot my password. Right. That's right. So, and, and you know, in terms of strong passwords, I have now gotten into the habit of having the password managers create strong passwords for me. Mm -hmm. But when I have to create them, I make up a long phrase using words that don't belong together. In fact, hang on, you're multilingual. I'm multilingual. I will actually mix languages. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh, that's that, a good idea. So then yeah. the chances of some kind of a dictionary attack. Oh, no, my, my, my mom does that. Yeah. It's a great idea. Yeah. It is a good idea. So you can mix Hebrew, you know, and English, I will mix, um, you know, English, Tagalog, and French, and the chances of a dictionary containing those words, even if they're normal words, mm -hmm. are pretty slim, and then if I add a character and a number somewhere in the middle, it gets exponentially harder, Correct. right? So I think that's what you're looking for. So here are some of the programs, and please don't delay on this. It is quite shocking how many clients we know it's mm -hmm. individuals and as organizations that don't do this. And I think most organizations really underestimate the number of passwords that they have as organizations. Yes. And how many, yeah, well, so we even, we even looked at it for a little bit and we went to our, even like our um, HR folks mm -hmm. and they're on a corporate level, easily logging into 15 Absolutely. different websites. And then, and then the you go to the marketing folks, folks and they're a different 15, right? And then if, God, and then IT. Yep. So, so organizationally, people are using lots and lots and lots. Of, look, this is the this is the natural result of what's been going on for the past years, which is everyone's been taking their information systems and moving them into the cloud. Right. So if they're in the cloud, you access them through a web browser right. and a name and password. Right. All of a sudden, we're sitting here with tons and tons and tons right. of websites that right. we access. Right. Right. And we forgot, sort of, to put our arms around that and say, hey. How do we hold on to those passwords, right? Because right. when we had file servers, and that's all we had, and all the applications were on file servers, once you got your name and password to the network, we could control everything internally. But now that it's out on the cloud, it's, it's not the case. So you got to pick. You got to start thinking about uh, password managers on a corporate level. Um, we're looking hard at LastPass as our recommendation these days. We have a few clients on it; they like it. Um, there's other ones. I. I they're all, good. They're, all good. They're all good. They're all good. They're all matter. good. It was just got to pick one and roll with it. You know, and I'll tell you, as a family, we actually set up LastPass for myself, my husband, and my two boys. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking how many passwords the eight-year-old has. Oh, yeah. He's got a password to the mathing that he does online, Absolutely. to the blog he created, to the yep. Spanish site, to Fortnite, to Minecraft. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how many passwords. And he was using the same one because that was easy for him to remember. And I said, oh, yeah, that's good. 
Yeah, I've been using Dashlane personally, and what I like about that on a personal level is it monitors if your if any one of your passwords has been exposed on the dark web. LastPass does that too. That's LastPass good. will say, "Hey, it, you can it'll it, if like one of the accounts where you have mm -hmm. a password gets compromised, they'll send you an alert. Yeah. If it's in the one of 400 million passwords that's been compromised, they'll let you know, and they'll also run a report and tell you which of your passwords is weak. Yes, yeah, same. So I think those two, LastPass and Dashlane, are probably the top two consumer ones for personal for personal use. They get all of the uh, PC Magazine Editor's Choice Awards between the two of them. Yes. Um, and I they're think they're also available for corporate. And they are available for corporate. And I think the whole world of corporate password managers is just now developing. I think it's it's one of those. It's a bit of a free for all. There's a ton of them out there. So we use Psychotic Secret yeah. Server. We mm -hmm. think it's great. LastPass is also available corporate, and so is Dashlane. Yeah. So I think it's good. I don't recommend KeyPass for corporate. Um, and and again, one more thing about these these pass uh, these password managers is they're multi-platform. So my LastPass, for example, works on my phone and my desktop at the office and my desktop. Oh phone. yeah, good point. So that I I'm never without a password. So right. I'm never you know kind of Including my passwords because it's really available everywhere. Right. Good point. Right. Enough about that. Oh, it's another really, really oh. good one is multi-factor. Yeah. Now explain what this is, Hanan. Uh, and multi-factor, some people call it two-factor authentication, right. as long as it's more than one factor. <laughs> right. 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 So, so um, the name and password is one way to authenticate, right? So if you know your username and you know your password, you can get into the website. A multi-factor authentication means we add in one more component, which could be that they send you a text to your cell phone, right? So now you know the username, the password, and in order to log in, you got to get that code on your cell phone. They can text it to you. There's sometimes programs like Duo or Google Authenticator right. where it'll give you like a code inside the app. It doesn't matter. It's a third factor, and that makes it a lot more calming if someone steals your passwords, right? right? Because right. They, they can't get in unless they also have your cell phone. Right. right. Which so does that, happen. It does happen. Yeah. But at least that's a little bit harder or a lot harder. Absolutely. And so our standing recommendation across the board, wherever you can do it, turn on multi-factor authentication. Google, G Suite, Office 365, CMS. Amazon. I don't Everything. care. Do it. Everybody's got it now. Push the button. Dropbox. The and work. don't think that it's hard. It's not. Because I remember when we rolled this out, people said, oh, is this going to be a pain to get into whatever? And what we use is we use an authentication server. We use Duo. Yeah, we use Duo. So what happens is if I'm trying to log into my email, I have to do what's called a Duo push. And Duo will send something to my phone, and it says, hey, is that you trying to get into the email? And all I need to do is say yes, mm -hmm. and I'm good. But again, I'm able to kind of authenticate on two systems, which is why it's multi-factor. And we have it also for our um, our virtual desktops as a service, so you, we can turn that on, and it's the same exact thing. So you want to try to log in, you're at your aunt's house on vacation right. <laughs> at the beach, yes. and you're using their machine to get to your, all your information, um, it's going to say, I don't recognize this machine, and it'll send you a duo push, and you right. click the button and you're in. Right, yeah. exactly. So really can't stress this enough. And what I say is, ask yourself, how much would it suck if your email was compromised? Oh. How much would it suck if your CMS oh. were compromised or your bank account or whatever? Oh. We have, um, uh, Brian and I, my director of new biz, we met with a prospect and they said, you know, we don't have budget for this this year because we lost a quarter million dollars in a, uh, a social engineering scam. So they didn't have budget. Yeah. I will, you know, before we go off of that, yeah. I have to call out one huge company that does not have dual factor authentication. What's that? American Express. Oh gosh. And I. I'm an Amex card I know. Absolutely. And gosh. I went and I went on their site and I went on the chat and I said, why don't you guys have two factor authentication? And the lady had the gall to tell me that their security team is so good that they don't need it. <laughs> It's not about their security team. It's about my security team and your security team. So, and, you know, maybe we'll shame them on social media. I know. Media. I was shaming them a little Let's bit. Them. They really need that. All right. Number eight is use a VPN. Again, because if you're using any type of Wi-Fi, especially the free public ones, unless you're on an HTTPS connection, mm -hmm. 
that data as it's traveling over the web is unencrypted. Correct. With the right equipment, someone can snap those bits from the air. Right. So let me let me just um, talk for a second about VPN and what it means. It's a virtual private network, which sort of means you're making like a private encrypted network between you and a server. Right. A private tunnel, network. right? A little tunnel, yes. Now, in the past, for organizations, um, the VPN was always a way to get back to your company firewall. Okay. And that was... And that's good. That's actually a decent VPN, right? There's no reason why that wouldn't work. And then you can access your shared drives and such, and that's great. Um, but these days, that's not even what we're talking about. If you can get VPN programs that have servers everywhere. That's right. And um, and they're actually they're for a long time we were calling them personal VPNs, but now you can get them for corporate use as well. And you just load up the program on your uh, laptop and you turn it on. And there's things, everything from one of them is called Tunnel Bear, and another one is called NordVPN, and just there's a million of them out there. So you pick one, you use it. We're now uh, fairly partial to one called Perimeter 81, which seems to actually be useful for companies. Um, and everybody has laptops these days. You know, we look through our clients. 55% of our clients have laptops as their as their machine of choice. Right, right, right. And so. These laptops are roaming, and they're in Starbucks, and they're in airport Wi-Fi's, and you know for all the good reasons. When they when you connect to free Wi-Fi, you really want a VPN active. Okay. And what it does, Hainan, is it makes all of your connections secure. Yes. Okay. So it, so it's not just the website that you're connecting to secure. Everything is secure. Everything is secure. Awesome. Yep. That's a really good piece of advice. Right, number nine is to back up everything. Is that a floppy drive? It is. <laughs> is that the international symbol for backup? It is, isn't it? It's a little icon oh, really still these days. It's hilarious. I um, probably have people on this call who don't even know what that is. Yeah. Guys, we used to, in the past, I'm dating myself, in the way, way past, we used to back up onto these floppy drives. Okay, we don't do that anymore. I haven't for years. Um, but yeah, you know, Again, it's another one of these little cloud things that happened is now that we uh, are also mobile with our laptops, uh, we're everywhere. And we're saving documents instead of saving them into the cloud. A lot of times we're saving them on our laptops. Just, you know, not not to be mean, but just because we're just working really quickly and we want it in my documents. We want to work on our document. So we've also started recommending back up your laptops, back up Office 365, right, right, right. back up everything. And Hanan, there's another good reason for this. We had a client that got victimized by the, what is it, the, the ransomware, ransomware. Yeah. that would encrypt your drive. So yep. now your drive is unusable. But if you've backed things up, you can just say, well, you know, go pound sand. I can just go back yeah. to, you know, a backup from whatever. So and, if you, and if you haven't backed up, you cannot say go pound sand and you have real trouble. Right. Yeah. Right. At that. Um, so there's an article that we're going to send to you as part of the follow-up. This is many years ago now, but there was a famous, it was a Wired reporter mm. that got spearfished. And because of flaws in Apple's and Amazon security, somebody was able to get in, change his Amazon password, mm. get, get into his iTunes account, and wipe everything on his computer, tablet, and phone. Because they did the erase everything. Mm. So that's pretty scary. It's scary. I mean, it's a terrifying article. And then number 10, if you think you've been compromised, shut off your machine and call IT. Because if you shut it down, the compromise can stop. Yeah, at least it won't spread. Right, right. And also, if they're in the middle of copying something, you can just shut it down. Yes. Unplug it, turn it off. Exactly. End of story. If something weird happens to your computer, by the way, again, like you get a weird pop-up, Turn off your machine and call IT. Yes. If your if your email is just doing weird things, shut off the machine and call IT. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All right. So here are our favorite tools to protect against. And, and by the way, we'll send off. We have a, a, a little infographic with those top ten tips. Yes. This is a great infographic, and we recommend that you print it out and stick it on your fridge and stick it in your office kitchen. Yes. So while people are microwaving their food, they can read it because they have nothing educated. else to do. Absolutely. Yes. Good. All right, so these are the must-haves. 
centralized patching, what the heck does that mean? That means that you know that all your laptops and desktops and servers are all being patched with the latest security updates. It's very important. So, and it's important to do that because most people kind of on their own won't do it. They'll just keep their laptops on and it's a pain to reboot yeah. and install the patches. Yeah, some people will, some people won't, and it's not anything malicious, but really from it a... It only takes one, that's right. And really from a security and proper system management point of view, you want IT to be taking care of that for you. And same with, same with antivirus, anti-malware. A lot of the spam filters will catch some of the very basic phishing attacks these days, right. which that's is right. good. So you need a good spam filter. Uh, actually, even if you have Office 365 um, or G Suite, it, it doesn't hurt to put a spam filter in front of that to help catch the spam a little better. And what do you recommend for that? Um, we're using a great company called Fusemail uh, for all of our clients, but there's other ones out there. Okay. Good one called Mimecast. Barracuda has one. Okay. And then a firewall that's actually monitored and managed as yep. opposed to just sitting there. Correct. And then some type of a robust backup. Backup, 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 backup. Yeah. Very good. Um, so it sounds a little bit messed up, sorry, in the slide. So here are some <laughs> other ones, right? So thing. I think it's, <laughs> it's kind of wandering around. So, so, so tell us more about the no before. So uh, we've, wow. this, this webinar is probably one of the best examples of security training. And it's something that you want to do in your organization. So it's, it's a little harder to get it at, as an individual, but um, it's almost, becoming as important as you know harassment prevention training. And it's just becoming a, a very necessary thing to train everyone in your organization about all these things we've been talking about, the phishing and the, um, you know, and what you need to do to be secure. And then also things like your company policies and the software that you use as an organization to do the protection and all, and who, you, who to call for IT and all those things. So, so, Know Before is probably the leader in the security awareness training world. And they have two things that they do really well. One is they do phishing simulations. So that's what I was talking to you about earlier. And they will do a, a campaign of fake phishing emails across everyone in your organization. And they will catch people and they will force them to watch little videos. Right, so it's sort of a training. You get a report of who. You do get a report, but really you want to look at it on a big level, right, which right. is like, like you do it once. Of my staff. Right, and 33% of my staff clicked, and then if we repeat this again in in three months, did it go down? Did it go down? Um, and it usually does. You're usually actually getting a 30% reduction um, just by using this tool. Uh, and the other thing they have is a phenomenal library of videos that you can actually use this library of videos for your ongoing training. Awesome. Um, so we have in our, um, not only do we offer this as a standalone service that we'll do for our clients, but we've actually included this in our comprehensive fixed price service too. Because nice. I think it helps clients and it helps us too, so it's, it's great to do. And then you talked about Perimeter 81 as a, your favorite VPN. This is now solution. my favorite VPN solution. Okay, boy, that's a really good recommendation. And then we talked about the password manager. So yep. be thinking about implementing those things. So how do you assess how vulnerable you are, right? So yeah. I think these are the questions to ask your, yourself and your organization. Some of you on the phone might be saying, oh my God, you know, I might be at risk. And some of you might be saying, you know, we're sitting pretty, but I think these are the things that you want to ask. Are you high risk? Yeah. These, are big, these are big picture items. Are you subject to compliance regulations? If you or your members are subject to HIPAA regulation, Sarbanes-Oxley, GDPR, any of those things, you want to make sure that you're extra careful. Right. You handle personally identifying, uh, identifiable information, any type of confidential information. And I think, Hanan, Social security say, even just address these days, home address is considered PII. Remember, you could be handling it for your employees, too, not Absolutely. just your members. Yeah. That's right. Here's some other questions. Um, They're just basics. Right. right? Uh, do you have your technical defenses up? Do you have an awareness training program? Are you doing some kind of regular security, cybersecurity risk assessment and remediation? It's really useful to do this. We like it. If you can, you do it on an annual basis um, by a third party. And 
Do you have the right policies? Do you have cyber liability insurance? Talk to your insurance agent, by the way. Yeah. I was surprised at, it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't exorbitant either. Mm -hmm. So, And I thought it was really very, very well worth it. So we found, strangely enough, that our errors and omissions insurance that we already carry was stronger than the cyber liability insurance okay. offering that were out there. So really, it, you really need to speak with a good agent and make sure that you've got the right insurance. You need it. You know, and then my last thing is, I love you really it. need to keep that data. I love it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like we used to say, if the princess isn't in the castle, the castle won't be stormed, right? These days, that's not actually true. The castle's still going to be stormed, but they're not going to find the princess because she's not there. So here's what I tell folks. Ask yourselves, what data are you storing that you really shouldn't? And there are lots of things. I'll give you an example. We were doing an audit of our client's AMS system, and we found social security numbers like in the notes field. Right. And we said, oh, my God, why are you keeping that? And they said, because we were doing an event at the White House, and Secret, Server wanted, Secret Service wanted the social security numbers. And I said, why are you keeping it? Right. And they said, oh, you're right. We forgot to scrub it. So that's yeah. one example. Great example. Um, we have some clients that say, hey, we keep all the credit card numbers long, long after the meeting is done in case somebody wants a refund. And that's not a good example. Like we say, not a good reason. Actually, that's against PCI rules. PCI says, hey, when you don't need this anymore, you gotta you gotta expunge the credit card. In fact, if you can use a third party PCI Absolutely. credit card processor. And don't even have that data touch that no, your server. Don't need it. Um, I'll tell you, I also tell people there are sneaky places where there's data that could be compromised that you don't even know. Mm -hmm. The email of your, um, the email sent box of your admins and HR. Because here's what happens. The insurance company will say, hey, we need to reprice your health insurance. Can you send me a census? Mm -hmm. And they'll ask for name, date of birth, right, and social security number. Or maybe not social, but they want like address and so they have state and they have the date of birth for folks. Right. And like, unless you're going in there and proactively deleting the stuff or you've got a uh, document retention policy that says anything older than six months is gone. Now, like you didn't even realize it, the email got compromised, and your all of your employees' personal information got compromised. So, yeah, find great, the great sneaky point. places where this data might be. Yeah, good idea. All right, so just really quickly, here's really some quickly, yeah. Your staff. Um, well, so all when this stuff, right? Look, when you put together your own slide slide deck and you're up there in front of all your staff and you're trying to give them an annual security training, which is great. I mean, really, you don't need us for this. You can stand up and do yes. this. Take these slides. But take these matter. slides. We don't care. You know, but you want to also put in some very specific things for your association. You do. Um, compromises in your industry, right? Make it tangible. Explain what's, why it's so important for the people to pay attention. To and people. use real life scenarios. Yeah. Because if you just say, oh, use a password manager or do this, right. it doesn't necessarily hit home. But if you say, hey, this happened in our company, this happened to me, this happened in our industry. Yeah. Here are some examples. Exactly. So make it very specific. So we always end every webinar with an action plan because we know that you're, you're hopefully leaving this webinar and saying, wow, there's some stuff that I need to be doing. So what can you be doing? So number one is identify your areas of vulnerability. What type of hack would severely affect your company? And the reason I say this is, in the end, you're probably thinking, oh my God, we're vulnerable in so many ways. Mm. But you can't attack it all at once, right? So, so look at the most vulnerable areas of vulnerability and attack those first. The ones that would really, so that you can start to prioritize. And we'll send, we'll send you a, a self-assessment. Awesome. So you'll be able to walk through it and kind of look at your points and see what's, where you're vulnerable. Yes. Talk to your yeah. team. Talk yeah. to your, if you've got an outsourced network management company like Optimal, talk to them and say, hey, talk to me about the physical security that you're putting in place, but talk to me about the non-physical things, the social engineering, these things that we can be doing. Talk to me about doing a no-before campaign, et cetera. Right. Develop a training plan. So here at Matrix Group, we actually believe because we, we handle so much data and because we're in a position of just, you know, of confidence, we actually open every staff meeting with some type of security training. So we just we just build it into everything that we do. And then develop a roadmap. I'm also fond of saying, look, first of all, security is 
kind of an ongoing journey, right? Mm -hmm. You can't ever say we're done, we're secure because the threats continue to evolve. Not to mention the fact that most organizations don't have the money to really address everything right away. So ask yourself, what can you do this quarter or this month to make your organization more secure? What can you do next quarter? What can, what can you do next quarter? And before you know it, over the course of the year, you've really made your organization much more secure. And start with the things that will make a big difference, like a password manager for the organization. Right. Hinan, so. anything to add? I don't. This is perfect. If you, if you take this as a takeaway from, the, from this webinar, you will be doing yourselves and your companies a great service. Absolutely. And your families. Russ, do we have any questions? Well, we are here to take questions. We'll, we'll stick around for a few minutes. But in the meantime, um, this is contact information that you will have in the slides for myself and for Hainan. Please feel free to reach out um, if you've got questions about this. We really do wish, because we feel so strongly about this topic, we welcome you sharing this webinar far and wide. Yeah. <laughs> share the slides, share the knowledge, share it on social if you have some takeaways. Are there any questions? Well, Hainan, as always, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to do this awesome with you, Joanna. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, super fun. So thank you, and we hope that you're a little bit wiser and a little bit more secure as a result of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.